Welcome to the Quintuple A discussion for Monday, July 18th, 2022. Thank you so much for being here and uh, you all have the floor. Thank you. Well, I, I'll start, I guess. Uh, I created a document that proposes a somewhat more complicated authentication scheme than we had been considering, just a little bit more complicated. I think it's very much worth it. Um, it uses a little more crypto than before and is it's still pretty easy to defend as not encryption for the purpose of in obscuring communications info, uh, but maybe not quite so easy to explain. Uh, we can go over that here uh, just for tutorial purposes for anybody who might be watching the video. Um, probably not in, in super great detail. The document is available on the repo for you to peruse. And I encourage everybody who has any interest in security and crypto stuff to please go read the document and tell me what silly crypto newbie mistakes I've made. Um, I know it's hazardous to design a crypto system without being a crypto expert. Here I am doing it anyway. So, uh, Let's do a little bit of a walkthrough. I'm going to share a, my screen to uh, present a little diagram. OK, good. So this is a mermaid diagram, which, by the way, is a very cool tool for doing certain kinds of diagrams inside a markdown document um, that shows the message flow for authentication. It's not the whole story, but is a key part of it. And most of this is indistinguishable from what we did and what we've had in the in the pipeline for a couple of years now. The basic idea is that the uh, satellite is always broadcasting certain basic information you need to know in order to do authentication. <clears throat> About once a second is a suitable broadcast interval because a new station coming online for the first time, or even for the for however many times. Um, we'll have to know some of this information before it can get into the system and start using it. So uh, you don't wanna have a huge delay on startup just waiting for the broadcast to come around. So once a second. And then whenever the ground station feels like it, it starts to transmit. It doesn't have to do any formalities up front. It just transmits uh, using whatever old authentication values it has lying around. And if it's never authenticated before, then there'll be some default specified in the ear interface document, which generates non-trivial looking data, but obviously won't be secure at that point. And then the policy, the decisions about who gets what and who has to pass what challenges lies completely with the satellite. It will be configured by the satellite's owners to satisfy whatever requirements they may have. Hopefully yeah, the default will be open access to everybody, but there may be certain cases in which there, this has to be restricted to some extent. And when the policy decides that it's time to, to authenticate a user, make him prove that he's really who he, say, he says he is and, um, and get set up to do further validation of his transmissions from then on, then the satellite sends a directed message, which I'm calling the direct auth challenge. Uh, and it goes to a particular station according to his identity, which he's been using already on the satellite if he's already transmitted. This contains some of the crypto information for the, uh, for the authentication challenge. The station will notice this message if it's complying with the air interface spec and will then respond with the auth response message, which contains his part of the, uh, the information for the crypto. I'm speaking as if these stations are people and I'm using male pronouns out of long habit, but uh, I don't necessarily mean that the, the user is a, is a man. Um, that message goes up to the satellite or the whatever station we have doing the central function. And it will be able to authenticate the user using the certificate from logbook of the world and it will be able to complete uh, a key exchange procedure with the uh, the ground station 
which results in a shared secret uh, between the satellite and the ground station. It's not a communications, so it's not a not secret communication information. It's just a shared secret that's been created by this protocol. There's no way to transmit information this way, theoretically, according to crypto. And uh, then it has everything it needs in order to get started. And it sends back an auth ACK message giving the result. Typically, if everything is happy, the result will be a welcome message and the ground station is allowed to continue transmitting using the new crypto uh, authentication tokens. And there will be a particular time designated in the auth act message at which the new information takes effect. So there can be a clean switch over at exactly the right agreed time, no interruption in the uplink transmission. The only requirement really on the uplink is that these messages get sent. Just the one auth response message really, which may take a little bit out of the, the voice capability if that's what the ground station is doing. The exact contents of these messages has been, well, not maybe not precisely set out, but set out in general in this document. And I think I've got the, uh, the fields we need to get the crypto to work. The Diffie-Hillman requires a random number from both sides running through a computation on both sides and then the results exchanged. And then both sides have the shared secret with, after a, a further single computation. And then from then on each individual uh, frame that gets transmitted will have a token. And this token doesn't have to be very big because it's only authenticating a frame or a small number of frames uh, of transmission, but it has to be reasonably unpredictable so that the, an attacker can't uh, just start generating those by itself. So we use a system very similar to the little plug-in uh, dongles that are used for uh, secure communications in the corporate world, uh, UB keys or the like. It's a little tiny thing that has a small display with six digits on it. And every 30 seconds, maybe, or some other interval, the number changes and the server knows when, when it's changing and what the cryptographically secure pattern of numbers is. We use that same system, although we don't distill it down to six digits. We use the whole 32 bytes of, of crypto information uh, developed by the, by the algorithm, which is called HMAC SHA-256. We call it HMAC for short. Uh, the HMAC get, can get recomputed re periodically whenever you run out of information to send as tokens. And in the maximum security setting, then each token is used exactly once for exactly one frame. And that means you run out of tokens about every two thirds of a second. And you do the computation again, which takes a fraction of a millisecond on say a Raspberry Pi. And then you've got another two thirds of a second worth of information. So this is very feasible. It's not a huge computation, not a big load on the ground station. That load gets multiplied in the satellite by however many users it's trying to support. It's still within the realm of feasibility, but if it's not, the satellite can always just drop some. It doesn't have to authenticate every single frame. And if you do that, where the, the token rotates for every single frame, then there's no way to do a replay attack. The, uh, an attacker could listen to the uplink, even be parked right next to the uplink and hear every single frame. They won't be able to synthesize uh, a stream of frames that looks like the authentic users. If you want to reduce the load, then you can start repeating the token for some number of frames. And that slows things down in general, but it does open up a window for a replay attack. So I would, I would hope to keep it capable of doing the full, uh, full, fully secure one token per frame mode. Now, it, it may be the case that this is too much for the satellite, depending on what kind of computing hardware we're able to spare for, for authentication up there. 
but not every user needs this because not every user has a nearby attacker who's specifically trying to steal uh, their own uplink. So it might be the case that some users who do have this problem are going to authenticate with a new token every frame and other users might be doing it on a slower basis. So the protocol that I've written down and proposed uh, permits that. There's a way for the, the user station to say, I need to be more secure, I need to be less secure within a range permitted by the satellite. Uh, so this is a little bit more complicated. There's a, a three-step process where your, your identity is verified by a signature generated by your certificate, which by default is your ARRL logbook of the world certificate. That signature only is used during the message transaction and gives a, a pretty much ironclad guarantee that you are who you say you are as long as you haven't leaked your, your certificate secret key uh, to other people. In which case it can be revoked. Uh, there's procedures for that built into the certificate system. So that's step one. Step two is this uh, Diffie-Hellman key exchange, which is very standard. Lots of crypto protocols use it, uh, including over-the-air provisioning of cell phones, which is a much higher uh, monetary value transaction than the one we're doing. And lastly, uh, this HMAC procedure for generating a token for, for each frame or for every few frames. And all of this is existing crypto code. We don't have to write any crypto code. We can use the OpenSSL library to do all those procedures, or we can find uh, other open source code that, that does it. I found an HMAC implementation that, that can do uh, a few dozen of these computations for all different kinds of HMAC running the validation suite uh, on a Raspberry Pi in three milliseconds. So I think it's sub one millisecond, maybe by quite a bit, sub one millisecond on a Raspberry Pi to do one of these computations. So that's, that's very feasible. Um, that's a good summary of, of what's in that document. Read the document, uh, find the mistakes, let me know. There's lots of details that are not in there that'll have to be written down for a fully comprehensive air interface that is for the future. For the immediate future, the most urgent thing on this is probably to create a, a very concise presentation of it, more concise than what I've just done, and put it on a poster. And I'm hoping we can display that poster at DEF CON coming up here in a couple of weeks um, so that some of the people who have the most familiarity with, with breaking crypto systems in the world will get a chance to look at it. Hopefully a few of them will think about it for a few minutes and, and tell me what's wrong. That's, uh, that's the big chunk of progress that we've made recently here. Um, any questions? Okay, uh, over to Tilak for his uh, project. Yes, uh, good board. Thank you. Yeah, Paul, well, actually, I have one doubt here. So, when you say ECDH, uh, Electric or Defi Hellman uh, versus Defi Hellman, uh, so I think in many of the parts of the document you mentioned about using only Defi Hellman, but not ECDH, uh, I think they, they fundamentally differ, differ by a bit, right, in the terms of how they do the mathematical calculation. So, so here, are we seeing only ECDH or DH? I mean, it's, a, it's a bit confusing there. Okay, good, good point. Uh, I don't know. I don't think it matters. Uh, I've chose, I put in elliptic curve to the because it's modern and cool. It's supposed to be a little bit lighter weight. Um, and if that turns out to be true, then we'll use it. And if not, we can use the standard Diffie-Hellman. The same outcome either way, I think. Okay. So in that case, I think uh, at least from my readings, I came to know that ECDH is the most advanced one and which is more trustworthy. So maybe, uh, yeah, maybe we could find out the differences and uh, further confirm that. Yeah. Okay. That's a good thing to do some research on. Yeah, sure. So from my side, uh, yeah, I spent some uh, some time in reading the document which Paul shared. I read that two to three times. 
and after some some days i got a better clarity of how it how it was working and uh, uh, yeah i think a, a better way of presenting that would be uh, is is what required for the poster right so i just uh, i had some draft version of a diagram i mean just just i scribbled down on my on my paper on how it could so that it so that with one that one diagram we could explain the whole process uh so th that's still in progress that's it's still not completed uh that that's about uh, putting up a big diagram uh it's still in progress so maybe at least i need another two or three days to stitch it up and uh, and put and put up that in the group and other than that uh, regarding my readings uh, regarding the jamming techniques and all so even they were i couldn't complete all of them but out of the minimal reading which with what i did i felt that the uh, of adaptive noise filter is something that which is a basic thing that which you can try and uh, see out. Uh, and other than that, uh, the other things which I read are a bit complex in nature, or if, or I thought it would take a, at least a lot of time. Uh, for example, using AI waveform recognition and, and a lot and a lot other stuff which I'm still reading actually. But I thought at least we could start with the notch filter to remove the interference. Uh, that would be a pretty good start is what i felt and that is where i would say probably uh, getting the paper would be very beneficial to us and i also reached to the authors of the document in research gate requesting for the document maybe we can do the same thing uh, with, with with you both uh, requesting that maybe that could help us better fetch the document in, in a more timely manner okay i can do that yeah do that. other than that yeah sure other than that i have uh, some doubts and some uh, some 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 things to discuss more uh, some two specific points which i can which i can do right now if it's okay yes please proceed okay so uh, when i speak about jamming uh, jamming anti jamming uh, techniques uh, the one thing which i thought is that uh, is it possible for us to include in the uplink protocol that the ground station should also reveal the power station source that which he has and he should be revealing that continuously so for that maybe we could make a mandatory requirement in the phase four ground firmware that is the ground station firmware uh, for it to be integrated with the device driver of the power source and it should be emitting the power sources uh, measurements continuously so that we will be aware of how much uh, how much uh, bandwidth this guy has what can he do i mean it's like a, a kind of behavior modeling that we get to know uh, whether he is just operating with the lithium ion battery or with a more powerful source you know so that that measurement or that parameter uh, if the satellite gets to know i thought based on that we could we could know what kind of authorization policy could we put in put him into so that we know maybe he's a is a probable probabilistic guy who could have a more jamming power and probably he could do a jamming maybe still he's authenticated and he's a good guy for now but maybe after some point he may go rogue and maybe that parameter of power source uh, is something that i thought would would help us uh, maybe you guys could better comment on it if it's possible or not another thing is uh, it's just a uh, reminder for us it's about the echo the echo thing which michelle has suggested last time uh, that is uh, an uplink Transmission should also consider contain an echo, uh, so that we get to know whether the user, if he gets to listen, listen it back, then it's it's a confirmation that he has the required setup ready uh, for for a successful tra transmission to happen. And I think this echo part, uh, maybe I thought we could put it in the acquisition process, the acquisition process of uh, whatever the mention there. Uh, yeah, th this is this is just a suggestion uh, that we could discuss on. But regarding the revealing of the power source. Uh, is something that we could uh, debate and discuss more on it with, uh, regarding its possibilities. Yeah, I'm done. Thanks. I missed a couple of the of key points that you made. There were, I was hearing some uh, some bit errors in the uh, in the Zoom call here. It's, some uh, distortion uh i'm not sure maybe you can explain again what you intend to achieve
okay, Paul, I think you dropped out. Is this better? Uh, yeah, just I just did that. Maybe you could see for yourself and, and we could discuss it at a later point even. Okay, so your intention is to, uh, I'm still not quite getting it. The, uh, the ground station transmits information about how much power he has, and then you're worried that that ground station might turn into a jammer? Yep, yep, yeah. So why so, would he have ever told the truth about what his power was if he was gonna be a jammer? Well, maybe this is measured. <laughs> exactly. It's measured power because we we depend on signal to noise ratio for all sorts of things, and we can measure it at the spacecraft. Is that we depend on cooperation for many things too? And um, yeah, unless you worried about an unintentional jammer. Well, I mean, we sh I think we should worry about both unintentional jammers and intentional jammers because you can see both of these things in actual spacecraft, both commercial and amateur. That's true. I don't, I, okay. I, 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 I lying. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yes, yeah, so, sorry. Uh, my intention of proposing this is that not not to know it at the signal power level, but at the system's power level. For example, say the Raspberry Pi is connected to a five volt source, uh, whether it's is it, is it connected to a lithium ion battery or or some other DC power source, which could which could uninterruptedly give more power or something like that. So I just wanted to know at the system level, how much is he capable of? From an implementation point of view, that seems to be a little bit problematic. The, the ground station box probably just has a power cord plugged into the side of it. It, it may not know whether it's plugged into a nuclear power plant or a, a small lithium ion battery. <laughs> Okay. 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 So maybe uh, I was maybe then we could think of something where let us come let us list out some points of how a normal jammer would work. Maybe he would be having some directional antennas, some specific uh, I don't know some some good power source, uh, and and we could verify that against against them maybe. Running through some behavioral modeling to see if he really has that kind of an antenna setup uh, through the through the RF uh, signals that we get. Um, maybe maybe I should better speak with some points listed out. I think it's confusing like this. Uh, maybe I'll I'll just do that. Maybe I'll just speak out uh, with a better written documentation. Yeah. Okay. Let I think the first step in that is to make it clear exactly which threat model you're trying to address. A real malicious jammer is not going to cooperate with any of this stuff. So you can't assume that you have all the jammers revealing their capabilities. But for a, an accidental interferer, you might be able to do something useful. Yeah, sure. Noted. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, the The way I look at it is from a, a noise. It's all it's all noise until it's signal, and all the noise that you have out there could be um, natural noise uh, from the environment or from your own electronics. Uh, so so you can self jam with a failed uh, you know electrical problem you know with with a failed circuit, um, and and then there's noise from from other people uh, that are that are maybe transmitting accidentally on top of you for some reason. And then there's intentional harmful interference, and there's all different types of that. So, so it'd be good to kind of say, okay, this which one are you worried about, and then and then tackle it um, because I I think the you're on to something with the especially with that paper. Uh, so if if we can get a copy of it from ResearchGate, that, that's great. And we'll wait a little bit, but if we can't get it, then then I'll go ahead and buy it because it, it looks good. Um, and it's essentially adapting to a narrowband jammer and 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 
you know, follow, I think notching it out with a, with a cool um, algorithm. And it looks like that. So uh, it's been cited and, and used elsewhere. And anything that has an implementation is a uh, popular to me. So, so, you know, if it, if it turns out we can't get it for, for no cost, then we'll, we'll go ahead and purchase it and see what it, what it tells us. And it's, it's talking about intentional jamming and intentional narrowband jamming is a big deal on satellites. It happens all the time. And, you know, we, we should look at this and see if there's anything that we can do to make our system more resilient. So it's a, it's a very good thing to, to look at and tackle and, and write about and try to solve. Yeah, we, we have some yeah, other cap sure. capabilities that we can use against a narrowband jammer. Since we have multiple uplink channels, we can reallocate, reassign. If the jammer is not smart enough to follow us around, we could uh, send the desired signal off to a different frequency. That's true. I mean, our decision making can happen so much faster than somebody with a knob, if it is a knob. The harder case is somebody that, that can tell uh, from our published documentation uh, that we're, our uplink channel is limited to 10 megahertz and simply jams the entire band. Well, if you've made the attacker overpower your entire uplink band, then you've won because that's it, the best you can ever. Yeah, that's that's the best you can ever do. And then we're, <laughs> so, so if we end up with that as the only threat model we can't address, then well, Good for we'll us. Be famous. We'll be famous. <laughs> so yeah, let's keep uh, hitting it. We do need a poster though. Is is there any draft that can be shared today? Is there any drawing at all that we can look at? Uh, unfortunately, no, no, not at this point. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, we're. But but, but I promise the next two to three days, I'll definitely send it up. Cool. Okay, I can't wait. It's going to be um, really looking forward to it. We'll, uh, we'll pitch in, we'll, we'll help however we can, uh, because I think we've got some good diagrams for the protocol and, and the things that you're bringing to the, to the project are excellent. And yeah, we should definitely take advantage of this opportunity to get it in front of a lot of different people that at DEF CON that have experience and expertise here. So, all right, looking forward to that. Let me, all right, back to one you. comment. The, uh, as, as it has to do with ground stations transmitting their uplink capabilities. There's definitely going to be some of that if we fully elaborate the air interface the way we've envisioned, because we want to have different classes of ground stations. Uh, maybe the basic class can only do voice, but uh, somebody with a bigger dish or a bigger power amplifier may be able to do uh, much higher data rates. So, and plus we probably want to be able to, uh, control the power on the uplinks. If somebody's using more power than he needs, then it might be desirable to turn that down. So all this stuff will be in the air interface once it's fully written. Uh, it's not, not authentication, not uh, authorization, but it might be access or one of the other A's. Maybe we can find a sixth A. Oh, but uh, this will be, uh, <laughs> it'll be in there. Maybe for version okay. 2.0. Okay. Got it. <laughs> awesome. Great. All right. Looking forward to uh, some drafts, and we'll keep working on the uh, the stuff that we're working on, and uh, looking really looking forward to this. Yeah. yeah sure. Very cool. Yeah. Thank you so much, Talak. Your your time and energy are deeply appreciated, and thank you, Paul, for helping out. This is great. All right. Any other last comments or questions before we close? Not from here. Nope. Okay. All right. I will edit this up and post it and see you soon. Um, I see that Talak has some questions on Slack. So if I can possibly contribute there, I'll uh, I'll decamp to there and um, and keep it going. All right. Thank you, everybody. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you.